feel in a prayerful yearning. Heart of heaven is turning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears. My eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. Feel a little prayerful yearning. Heart unto heaven is turning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Good morning. Good morning. So glad to see all of you here this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, welcome. If you get a chance to fill out a guest card that should be in a seat near you, uh, we'd love to know who you are and know if there's any way we can help you. Please give that to any one of us. And uh, we'll be happy to pray for you and help you in any way that we can. Um, next song is Where No One Stands Alone. And after this, we'll be led in our opening prayer. And if you would, please stand. <laughs> Once I stood in the night with my head out low in the darkness as black as could be, and my heart felt alone, and I Today is a day, Father, that we worship you, we give you all glory, we give you all praise. We thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for bringing us here safely, Father, to have visitors in our congregation, to have the family here that we have that is spiritually minded. We thank you for your word and how it enriches our life, Father. Please be with us this hour that we may give our heart, our mind, our soul to this worship, praising you, Father, being a servant of yours, a disciple of yours, Father, thanking you for what you've done for us, that great blessing of bringing your son, Jesus, down on this earth to die for our sins. At this time, Father, let us pre please pray for some of the shut-ins that we have and pray for Sarah Baker, Connie DeMoss, Carla Gardner, Olin and June Honeycutt, but June, 
Talita, Perry, Richard, and Peggy Stewart, and some of the people that we just haven't mentioned for a while, Father. Carol and Joe Garibaldi, just please pray for them. Pray for Angie's mother, Donna, and some of the other ones that I might forget, Father, like Carol's friends that have lost their father. Please be with them. Please help them daily. And just keep it mindful, Father, on our minds to pray for these people that need your help. We thank you for this service. We thank you for Ryan and his songs and Jared and his message that he's going to bring today. May we all listen with, uh, um, with ears that we may um, worship you in this service. We thank you for all these things. In your son's glorious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Next song is a medley of Near Still Near and It Is Well. <clears throat>
Christ before the Lord's Supper is low in the grave he lay, and if you would please stand. <coughs> Jesus arose too. That's proof that we too will be in, in Jesus' presence in the after we pass from here. Let me tell you what God's telling us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he says, I speak to sen sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Jesus? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, and we all partake of one loaf. And then if you take a look at chapter 11, verse 27, Following on from that, he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. So with that in mind, I have a suggestion. Because when we do the Lord's Supper, we're supposed to contemplate what Jesus has done for us and how he did it. So I personally am going to sit down while I eat the bread and I'm going to read Psalms 22, which is a good expression of the pain that Jesus went through on the cross. And before we go any further, did anybody forget their Emily? I forgot to say that at the beginning. Yay, everybody's smart. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the mercy and the grace and the blessings that you give us as Christians. That blessing is Jesus Christ who died for our sins and promises us everlasting life with you. Thank you. And we appreciate everything you do, you great and holy God. In Jesus' name, amen.
hope you're thinking about Jesus Christ as you take the Lord's Supper. I'd like to point out in Psalm 22, from verse 6 to verse 18, is a good description of what Jesus went through on the cross and how people treated him. You need to appreciate what he's done for you. You need to appreciate the fact that he went through all that pain. I don't think any of us would do it. Let's pray for the for the uh, wine. Father in heaven, thank you for providing this covenant, this representation of Jesus' blood poured over us for the forgiveness of our sins, so that when we so that when you look at us, you don't see our sins. You see us as a righteous person, acceptable in your sight, to be with you forever. We thank you. Thank you for that mercy and that blessing. In your son's glorious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's continue with our contemplation of Psalm 22. Okay, now's the time for the offering, which is separate from the Lord's Supper, of course. So now is the time when we pool our money together to try to, over time, help other people who are searching for God get to know him and then join us here in the congregation and be a part of us and make it so they too can have the promise and hope that we have, which is eternal life with God and Jesus Christ. So there's lots of different ways to give your offering. The, right here, there's baskets back there at the end of services. You can put an offering back there if you like. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for everything you give us. And now, Lord, we'd like to give back a tiny bit back to you so that we can get more people to join your flock to look to you as a savior, to know you as God, and to learn your will, and to live in accordance with your will. We pray and hope, Lord, that everything that is received today is used to better, to better our congregation and to seek out more people to be your children. And in your son's name we pray, Jesus Christ, amen. The song before the lesson is Oceans. <laughs> Yeah. 
so great to, to worship with you this morning. Uh, a few weeks ago, a friend uh, asked me to be a speaker at a youth event at another church this, uh, that was scheduled for this weekend, just this yesterday. Um, and so I accepted it. I started developing and working with them for ideas for the sermon. And then just a Sunday or maybe a Wednesday afterward, John comes up and says, hey, do you want to preach? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Or when? He said, yeah, February 18th. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we can do that. So, um, so yeah, uh, so this is, this is going to be the, the sermon that I, te- I taught yesterday. Um, and also for that event, we were given, you know, the, the guy that set it up gave me, you know, gave everyone topics and things. And it just so happened that he gave me the topic of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So I know Kenny just preached about that a couple weeks ago, so this will be kind of the the part two of the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego mini-series. Uh, so, so I hope you'll, you'll follow along this morning. Um, so, so humbled and, and grateful to be given another uh, opportunity to speak. So the, the theme of the, of the you know, youth event weekend that I was a part of this weekend was uh, overcoming the world. Uh, was, that was the theme. So it's taken from 1 John chapter 5, uh, where it says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And so everything was kind of hinging on that, that idea of overcoming the world. Um, another passage that, that I also thought of about that overcoming the world 
is in John chapter 16 uh, and verse 32, where Jesus says, Behold, the hour is coming, and indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So what a, what a powerful thought that is, that Jesus has overcome the world, and through our faith in him, now we can overcome the world as well. And so that was kind of the, the theme, the development of that this weekend. And so today, when we, when we talk about overcoming the world, uh, I'm going to be talking about it through that lens, through the lens of Jesus and our faith in him, is how that is, that is made possible. And so the, the topic that I was, I was given as, as sort of my, my theme was uh, overcoming our enemies in that way. And so that's what we'll be talking about this morning. So uh, also just as a note, there's no PowerPoint, so I welcome you to, to follow along in your Bible, take notes and things like that if you want, um, and uh, we'll go about it that way. So when we think about overcoming our enemies, uh, first off, who would you say your enemies are? Hopefully, you know, you don't have any, anyone that has sworn an, an oath of vengeance against you uh, for some, some evil that you have slided against them at this point. Uh, that, that'll come later. You know, but that'll, that might happen at some point. But, you know, there, there may be people that dislike you or, um, you know, don't like certain aspects about you or whatever it may be. But we don't really have, for the most part, any, any enemies in the sense of people that want to physically harm us on a daily basis. So when we think about that, do, do we really have any enemies? Um, maybe not, but what about spiritual enemies? Would you say you have any of those? Are there people in your life that would belittle you or, or mock you for being a Christian? Or even worse, people that may be aggressive or, or violent against you for being a Christian or your faith. Absolutely. There's, there's people like that out there that would be hateful towards you for what you believe. And if you haven't experienced that, you very well may at some point in your life. So how are we as Christians supposed to overcome that kind of oppression, that kind of persecution? that's really what it is. It's, it's an oppression. Um, so this morning we'll use, we'll use the story of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to, to explore that a little bit. And so we'll read the story and, and discuss it a little bit. We'll make some, some applications from it and then uh, reference a couple other passages and, and that'll be it. So that's the plan for the lesson this morning. So first, uh, if you want to turn over to the book of Daniel and just start at chapter 1, let's just kind of review the context a little bit. So the, the book of Daniel starts with, you know, the people of Israel under siege. They're being attacked by this, this king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, my favorite names in the Bible, it's so fun to say. Um, but uh, he's, he's come, and he's come as, as really the sword of God. He's come to besiege them and punish them uh, for some things that they had done previously. And so here he comes and just absolutely wrecks the, the city of Jerusalem and destroys the city. He ransacks it. He takes all of these golden vessels. As you kind of skim through chapter 1 here, you can see that. Um, just absolutely takes everything that they are worth and brings them all back uh, in captive, takes the people back captive to Babylon and brings all the gold and the wealth uh, from the city. But then there in, uh, in chapter one, it says, the text says, he ordered some of the, the best and the brightest young men to be brought to serve in the king's palace uh, as, you know, kind of a little bit higher slaves than normal. Um, so it's, it's a pretty good spot to be if, you know, for a slave, I guess. Uh, but interesting to note that these are boys. They, they're most likely teenage years, you know, 12, 13, 
12, 13, 14, however, 16, however old they are, they are young men. So he brings them in, he educates them in all the knowledge of Babylon and gives them new names. Uh, so among them are these three young men, or four young men, uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So he gives them these new Babylonian names that, that we know uh, much more familiarly, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these four kids in particular are selected to serve in the king's court, um, and they begin to endure all these trials and challenges that you can read about in the first chapter and, and the second chapter. But then things really begin to come to a head uh, for the latter three boys in chapter three. And so you can kind of turn there to, to skim over it for context. So here, Neb has set up this massive golden statue uh, that is kind of in his image, you know, this huge, you know, taller than the ceiling here of this golden image uh, of a man. And he says, yeah, when you, when you hear this, this cacophony of instruments play, I want you to worship and, and bow down to it. And this is your God. And uh, he says, if you don't, uh, there's a fiery furnace waiting for you on the other side. So under, under threat of violent death, you are to, to worship this idol. So it's pretty amazing and, and insane how, just how prideful this man is. And that's really, really the emphasis of the beginning of chapter three here is just showing how, how prideful this man is. So the time comes for everyone to bow down. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they refuse, they don't bow down. And the king hears about it, and uh, he brings them forward, and he says, all right, listen, guys, I know that maybe it's a little confusing, uh, you know, but when the music plays, you're supposed to bow down. So if you don't do it this time, I'll have to throw you in the fire, right? Uh, and so their response is really what I want to zero in on. So where I'll start reading here is in chapter 3 and verse 16. If you'd like to follow along, uh, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So there's a, really, there's a couple of really interesting things that I, I want to point out about their response because it's such, a, such an iconic, powerful response that they give. So first, I, I just love kind of the, the sassy reply that they give in verse 16 there. And there's like, look, there's really nothing to, to discuss. There's nothing to talk about. We've already made our choice, right? It's kind of what they're saying in verse 16. And then verse 17 and 18, there's this beautiful thought process that they go through where they say, God is able to deliver us from the fire, and he will deliver us from your hand. I think there's a really profound distinction to be made there. Uh, when I was kind of reading this again and, and going through it, I kind of saw it in this, this other light where they're saying, you know, God, he could save us from the fiery furnace, if, he, if, he, if that's his will, but he will save us from your hand, either way, either physically or spiritually. So we'll either die and be with God, or we'll live and be with God, is kind of what they're saying. But you have no control over us, King Nebuchadnezzar. So then in verse 18, they say, you know, even if he doesn't save us either way, we're not going to serve your gods. They'll, they'll, they leave it all up to God, knowing that he'll be with them no matter what. And they refuse to abandon that faith. So then, of course, you know the rest of the story. Um, they're thrown into the fire. Uh, they, they live, and there's this fourth figure kind of mysteriously walking around in the fire with them. Uh, symbolizing their, their protection and their, their, the presence of God with them. And Nebuchadnezzar sees that and he praises God and uh, worships the one true God. 
at least for a little while uh, until later in the book. But um, yeah, so just such a, a powerful example of faith and strength in the Lord. And so there's a reason why you know this the story is so popular, and especially coming from you know 16 year old boys, uh, this is particularly impressive of, of their faith. Um, so, yeah, coming back to our thought of overcoming our enemies, what are some ways that we can apply this story to that? And when, we think of, when we think of this example in light of overcoming our enemies, you know, what, what would you say? And so I, I drew a couple of conclusions from this text um, that I wanted to share with you uh, just for, for the thoughts here. So first, I would say, they overcame this enemy through their faith in God. Uh, the three boys, you know, there in verse and uh, verse seventeen, they said, "God is able to deliver us from the furnace." You know, when when you deal with people that want to bring you harm for your faith, or people that mock you or belittle you for your faith, do you ever stop to think that God is able to help in this situation? If somebody's making fun of you, do you ever think, all right, God, this, this guy's really in my face. Please just help me out with this one and turn to him. Faith is so much more than just our simple belief. You, know, you, you, can, have, you can have belief in all kinds of things, um, but that doesn't mean it's a, it's a tool. Um, you, can, you can believe you know, Pluto, Pluto is still a planet, but that doesn't really help you with anything. Um, it's, not, it's not a tool, and that's not an asset to you. But faith in God is. It's, you know, it can be used to aid you in all kinds of, of situations. Um, it can give you courage when you're afraid. It can bring you peace if you're stressed. Um, it can bring you comfort if you're hurt or joy when you're sad. All kinds of things that it can be used for. So here, for these three kids, their faith gave them strength in the face of oppression and, and the face of death. Um, and you know, we can, we can do the same with our faith today. Faith is a tool. So when your enemies threaten or abuse you in any way uh, or make fun of you or things like that, turn to God and lean, lean on your faith in him. Uh, there's so much guidance and support that we can gain from, from that faith. Secondly, in overcoming our enemies, I saw them remembering their promise, remembering the promises of God here. Um, there again in verse 17, he's, uh, the boys say, you know, he will deliver us from your hand, O king. And he will. So God has made, you know, several promises to his people all throughout the Bible. Some of them have been fulfilled already. Um, and they're kind of written for us to, to observe in history. Uh, some have yet to be fulfilled at all. There's prophecies that have yet to come. But then there's also prophecies and, and promises that uh, are continually fulfilled on kind of a daily basis, I would say. And I think these three boys probably had one particular promise in mind uh, that I thought of in, in Joshua chapter 1, if you'd like to turn there. Joshua chapter 1. I'll just read the first six verses here. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. 
And what a what a beautiful promise that is. You know, here God says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And I can't help but think that they were probably mindful of that when this was happening to them. You know, um, and isn't it amazing too, just despite having their their home destroyed, their you know, all their their livelihood and their life as they know it um, is taken from them, yet still they knew that God would not forsake them or leave them. And uh, and they thought, you know, all right, be strong and courageous, because here we go. So yeah, they they remembered their promises, uh, remembered God's promises. And then thirdly, in overcoming our enemies, we have to have a love for the truth. I think in verse 18, back in Daniel chapter 3, in verse 18, you, you see that. When they say, either way, whatever happens, we're not going to serve your false gods. We're not going to bow down to this thing you made just, you know, two seconds ago. Um, it's, not, it's not real. It's not true. They refuse to be, put, they refuse to be swayed in their belief of, of the one true God. And uh, so they had this, this love for the truth. And we'll see that in, in 2 Thessalonians, if you want to turn there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'll read just a little bit in verse 9. It says, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So here, if, if you don't deeply love what is true and, and nothing else, God's not going to stop you from believing something that's false. And here it even says he'll, he'll send you that delusion. And you know, that's, that's kind of a hard passage. That's, that's a lot to unpack, especially for someone new in their faith. Um, that's kind of a scary thought is that, oh, God's, God's going to let me go. He's going to let me believe something that's false. And that can kind of be a, a hard thing for someone new in their faith, but I think the way that I would I would describe that is just think about it from, from his perspective. Think about it from the perspective of being in a relationship. You know, if if you're dating or, or even married to someone and you notice that you know they're starting to develop feelings for someone else and they're kind of drifting away from you. You know, you can, you can try everything in your power to, to win them back or to, to gain their love again, but ultimately it's up to them. And that's, that's kind of a tragic reality, but that's how God feels about us. If we start to love something that's false or something other than him, he's going to try everything in his power to win us back, but he's not going to stop us from leaving. Um, and that's a, that's a sad thing, but that's the importance and the, the gravity of, of having a love for the truth. And I think that's so critical, especially as, uh, especially as a, a young Christian and, and as somebody young in the faith, when you start to encounter people that are, you know, your enemies, so to speak, is to chase, you know, love the truth, chase it, pursue it, um, seek it. You know, the Bible has all of these these different ways to describe um, the pursuit of this, this you know, hidden woman that is precious, and it's kind of just describing the truth or wisdom. And so, those are the uh, that's that's the, the the important thing there. So, the story of, of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah uh, is is so timeless and, and powerful. There's so much to be lean, to be gleaned from these young men, even today. Um, and for us, you know, considering how we can overcome our enemies, how we can overcome the world, um, we see that you know, we can overcome that through our faith, through our uh, remembrance of his promises, 
and then through our love of the truth. So I hope you've been encouraged and, and edified this morning. Uh, I hope you'll take it and, and think about it, uh, pursue it and chase it. And uh, you know, if, if you are struggling with, with, with a spiritual enemy of some kind, just lean on God and, and lean on your brethren here uh, for support. I want to read one more passage in closing and then we'll uh, sing the invitation song. If you'd like to follow along, you can, or I can just read it. That's in 1 Peter chapter 4. And verse 12, I thought it just fit so well uh, for what we're talking about this morning. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Thank you. Let's uh, stand and sing the invitation song. <coughs> Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Holy Son of God, sent from heaven.
be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to thank uh, Jared for stepping up for us and, and giving us a fine ceremony. It's always a, a special treat when we get to hear someone from the congregation uh, give a sermon. And I, I kind of abuse it with, with Jared. Every chance I get, I make him do it, but he doesn't say no, so it's pretty good. Um, we're going to miss you when you leave. For more than just your preaching, it's going to be it's going to be a sad day, but we're all going to meet in heaven one day. So, I'd like to thank anybody who participated in today's services. Uh, just a couple announcements. Uh, this is for the deacons. Just a reminder: you have a meeting in the high school classroom after services. You know, this couldn't shouldn't come as a surprise to you. So upstairs in the high school room after services. Uh, what else we got? There will be a VBS Zoom meeting next Sunday at 5 p.m. for anyone who wants to be involved in it at all. So I'm assuming the, the, the link will be out there. The link will be out there for everybody. So Pretty much you should all be there. Because um, we all should be interested in doing BBS. Uh, there's a young adult gathering at 6.30 at the Partain's home. If you would like to bring your favorite snack, do so. But it's not a requirement. Don't if you, oh, I can't, I can't, afford, whatever. For whatever reason, go anyways. If you're part of the young adult people. Um, I'm requesting your prayers for me and Barry as we're continuing our selection of, of the elders, of new elders. Um, we should have that accomplished by mid to late March. So let's give you kind of a time frame on that. That is all the announcements I have. If you will be standing, we'll be led to the <coughs> If you would bow with me as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you at the close of this hour, thankful for this time you've allowed us to gather together to sing songs to you, to partake in the Lord's Supper, to hear a portion of your word. We're thankful for the time and the efforts that were put together this morning by all those who led us on in our service this morning. We pray that it was pleasing to you. Heavenly Father, be with us as we depart. Pray again for those who were mentioned in need of prayers with the congregation. Pray that you'll watch over all those and help them to recover once again. Be with those who are traveling, <clears throat> help them to return to us once again. Watch over us as we begin this new week and help us to apply the things that were spoken of this morning. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.